it's time to talk about hold-up capacitors. Yep, a bunch of capacitors walk into a bank wearing ski masks and wait, what? No? We're not that kind of hold-up? Okay, scratch that. <laughs> Your system is running along happily, storing data to flash, buffering with RAM. These hold-up capacitors are just sitting around all lazy on the sofa. Then suddenly, boom, power goes out. The hold-up caps leap up from the sofa, jump up on their hamster wheels, and put enough power into the system to allow the data from the RAM buffer to be safely written to flash. Phew, <laughs> that was a close one. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. If you're designing SSD systems, you know you need hold-up capacitors. But what kind of capacitor should you use? My guest today is James Lewis from Kemet, and we're going to go deep on the subject of hold-up, or last gasp capacitors. <laughs> this should be fun. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about capacitors for SSD systems from Kemet. Hi, James. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, you're welcome. I'm looking forward to our talk. Okay, so we're going to be talking about capacitors for SSD holdup. But before we jump into all of that, let's talk a little bit about what happens in general when the lights go out. Power failures are real. I mean, James, what's the big picture here? <laughs> okay, yeah, I think if we look around, we all hear about how data centers are growing. I see lots of different numbers, like this 400 million new servers by 2020. And so I think a lot of us can think about when a data center loses power, there's a generator or some battery on site to help keep power going. But if you kind of zoom in to where the actual data is stored, it's really important to think about how does the data itself get stored when a drive or a device like a drive loses power. Okay, so let's get a little engineery here. Hold up doesn't mean a robbery in this context, right? It's the term for what we're doing to keep life support while our data is being saved. Is that correct? Yeah. Over the last couple of years, I've heard a number of different terms that relate to the same kind of circuit or process we're talking about today. And so like power loss eminent or power loss protection, data loss protection, data persistence. But the two most common terms that we hear is hold up or sometimes people specifically say SSD hold up. And I think it's more fun to talk about last gasp, which is kind of an interesting way to think about what these devices are doing. Last gasp, I like that. So James, it seems like this holdup concept could cover a pretty broad amount of the market. What kinds of application areas are we really talking about here? So to have a context for what we're talking about today, you could look at any device with flash memory in it that would have some kind of holdup circuit. If we kind of go a step higher and think more in terms of drive type storage, we could think about something like a consumer device, like a tablet or a cell phone. Those will have some flash memory in them, but we don't generally worry about what's gonna happen when they lose power. Then we can move to what we're calling a client now, and there's lots of terms that's been thrown around. So like a notebook or ultrabook or even a desktop. And keep in mind that a desktop will actually sometimes have a hybrid device where it's both a traditional spending drive along with some flash memory. And then lastly is in the enterprise space where we're actually talking servers or clusters where there's quite a bit of data storage going on. And what we know is as you go from your cell phone all the way up to a storage array in a data center that the loss prevention becomes much more critical. Okay, got it. Uh, so James, how different are the client and enterprise applications from this perspective? Well, let's kind of look at this from three different aspects. And so if we think about in terms of performance, with a client device, usually there's only one user that's accessing it at any time. And there's usually more tolerance for variations in data latency. And what I mean there is if you open up a file to edit in a word processor, and it takes a little bit longer than to start playing a song, most users don't really care about that. But if we go look at the enterprise side, it's much more critical to know what the absolute latency is going to be and keep it as small as possible. Meanwhile, keeping in mind you're supporting multiple users, and in this context, users could mean people or other devices. In terms of reliability, the most common thing that we look at is how many bit errors are going to occur after data has been stored for some amount of time. And that time could be divided between when the device is active versus when it's inactive. And so, you know, if we look at enterprise, what's interesting is I've seen one spec that says you can only have one unrecoverable bit error 
per one error of 10 quadrillion bits. And so to me, that sounds like it would never happen, but the idea that we have to make sure that it doesn't is critical. And then let's also look at endurance. In enterprise drive, I don't think it's too hard to imagine. We need something that runs all the time. It's always open, it's always on, it's always doing something. But when you step back and look at it, there's been some studies that show that client drives are actually inactive about 80% of the time. And so they're actually either asleep or they're idling. Okay, so when you say idle, what does that mean in terms of the data itself? That's a great question. So if we just think about the data, not the drive, there's two sort of states that it can be existing in. If it's at rest, that means it is permanently stored into the storage medium. Now, when I say permanent, there's always some degradation. That's where the reliability we talked about comes from. But as far as the system is concerned, it's done. What we're talking about today is in flight, and that's where data is being transmitted from the host into the storage device and then eventually into permanent storage. And even once that data has been transmitted, until we get an acknowledgement back, it's not considered out of flight. It is still in flight until we know for certain it's been stored. Okay, cool. So James, do you have a physical picture of what we're talking about here? Maybe an example of what a typical drive looks like? The example that I have is a typical 3.5 inch drive form factor, but it has elements that are common to most SSD or even flash systems. Obviously there's the flash memory. That's where we're trying to store the data into. Connected to that is going to be a buffer or cache which is also connected to a controller, which is helping to manage how we get data in and out of the flash memory. And depending on the type of the design, it may also provide the interface or IO. So like in this particular example, we actually have a SATA type drive. And then to help support the holdup application are, oddly enough, capacitors called holdup capacitors, which are what will provide a bank of energy when the drive loses power. All right. Okay. So how does data typically flow through one of these? Uh, give me a roadmap. I've got a high level look at how data can flow through a system. And so if we kind of look at this block diagram, let's say the host transmits a block of data. It gets transmitted over the IO channel into a buffer. It's stored in that buffer until the NAND memory can finish writing out whatever was transmitted. Now what's not shown in this diagram is once it's been written, there will be a message back to the host to let the host know that the data has been acknowledged. Okay, I think I've got a handle on the holdup buffer thing, but what do I need to consider when I'm designing the holdup capacitor bank then? Right, right. So yeah, so once we get this data into the drive, we tell the host it's taken care of, we have to think about what happens if we lose power. And so that's where this whole concept of holdup capacitors or a holdup bank comes into play is that we're trying to create a bank of energy to make sure we can flush that buffer out. And so you might think, oh, the number one thing to worry about is capacitance. And we're going to get to that, but really it's these other elements. The first thing we typically have to look at is how much height is available. We know that in all these systems, there's a limit to how high components can be. Then the next thing we like to look at is how much energy is required. And so when I think about the energy requirement, I'm thinking about how much time will it take and how much power will get used. And so where we have to think a little bit is in terms of voltages. And so if we have a circuit where we're driving directly or there is no converter between the bank and the controller, then we know that at some voltage, the controller will drop out. However, if we're using some kind of converter like a boost buck converter, then we're gonna have a place in there where we know that we can operate at a certain voltage, say five volts, and at say three volts, our controller will drop out. And so that actually changes the band of energy that we're actually able to use. And so we have to think about what is the lowest voltage that our circuit will operate at. And then the last consideration is the actual board space available. So height is important, but also X and Y. How much area do I have available on the board? Now, to make this a little bit easier, we've taken these three elements and we've built them into a calculator that allows you to actually just go in and put in these parameters and then we'll come back and tell you how much capacitance you need which works easy for us to talk about but it's really calculating how much energy is needed in order to achieve your hold up time okay so james i've used the tool and done my calculations and whoa i need a lot of capacitance am i going to be able to fit that into my system we need to talk about form factors here well, you know, being the electrical guy, I'm not all that concerned about how the mechanics work. Uh, I just want to make sure we make that capacitance number really, really big. Okay. Okay. So seriously, once we have an idea of how much capacitance you need so that we know how much energy you can store, 
then we like to talk about where you're going to put these devices. So here's three common form factors. There's the drive style, which I showed you the picture of earlier. And then there's add-in cards, which will typically plug directly into say a PCI Express bus. We see these a lot in enterprise systems simply because the performance is so much higher on the IO. And then becoming very popular are these smaller IO modules, which tend to be more of a client focused device. They tend to go into things like laptop, but we're also starting to see them be used in conjunction with some of these other devices in larger data storage systems. Okay. So when a lot of us hear big capacitor numbers, like the one on just calculated, we think, Hey, super capacitor, but what are the actual options for this kind of thing? Well, before I talk about the different types, I would like to point out as somebody from a capacitor company, I think that all capacitors are super. Okay. <laughs> but there are other types of capacitors we can talk about. Everybody that does anything with electronics has designed in a ceramic capacitor at some point. And so depending on the design, you might be considering an X5R or X7R ceramic capacitor. One advantage that these offer is they have a super wide range of footprints and heights available. However, you have to consider what do they do with voltage, temperature, and time, which we can talk about later. The supercapacitors, like you mentioned, there's various form factors, but in SSD applications, what I've seen most often are what sometimes get called prismatic. They're basically like these flat packages that kind of sit on top of the board. And so these tend to have rated voltages in the range of three to five volts. And we have to think about how much they're gonna change over the time that they're actually in operation. Aluminum electrolytic capacitors could either be a service mount or snap-in style they have a really large capacitance and relatively high rate of voltages, but we need to also think about how they lose capacitance over time. A lesser known capacitor type is what we call KO cap. Now this is a solid capacitor, meaning that there is no electrolyte inside of the capacitor package. The dielectric is based on tantalum, and so it has a couple of different trade names. For example, we call it KO cap. You might also hear these just called polymer tantalum, or sometimes we actually just call them polymers, which ironically confuse people with film capacitors, but it's the cathode material that we're talking about here. The true advantage that these provide is that they have very large capacitance, in relatively large rated voltages, but they're also some of the smallest capacitors that you can find. All right, James, let's get this over with. How do the dimensions compare? How big are these suckers? Well, as I kind of mentioned, KO caps tend to be the smallest, aluminum electrolytics tend to be the tallest, and then super caps, they tend to be the most flexible in terms of how you build them. And then, like I said, ceramics have a wide range of footprints and heights available. And so what I find is unique is that they can be very big, but they can also be manageable in the sense that we can get smaller pieces that help to add up to that big capacitance that you calculated earlier. Okay, cool. So what about rated voltage? Does rated voltage play into the choice of one of these options over another? You know, that's actually a great question because I did bring up rated voltages a few minutes ago. And so why would that play a role? So there's a couple of things we need to consider. First, all capacitor technologies are going to have a high end to what their maximum rate of voltage is. And they're also going to have a sweet spot where we can get the most capacitance out of a certain voltage. As I alluded to during the calculation talk, keep in mind that whatever your converter circuit is using is going to help dictate the rate of voltage of the capacitor. And so, for example, today we're seeing a lot of these controllers designed specifically for SSDs sort of topping out around the 35 volt range. And so actually on the slide that I'm showing, I've purposely or artificially limited the technologies to 35 volts. With the exception of super caps, all of these technologies have higher rated voltages available, but for an SSD application, you're typically not going to consider something more than 35 volts. Okay, and when you say voltage to rating on this slide, you mean I can't use up these to the full rated voltage? You know, Amelia, we could probably have a whole nother chalk talk just about the derating subject. What I wanted to bring to light here is that even if a capacitor is rated at 35 volts, you may not be able to use it at 35 volts. And so, for example, on a KO cap, you do have a 10 to 20% voltage derating depending on its rated voltage, which means if it's rated for 35 volts, it's probably usable in a 28 volt application. Now in the cases of SSD drives, we have higher rated voltages that you could derate down to 35 volts, so we're still covered there. If I look at supercapacitors, depending on the vendor, they will derate the lifetime if you apply the full rated voltage to them, and so they typically will say 
you know, for example, the one example I found, it's rated to four volts, but they really want you to use it at three. In the case of ceramic capacitors, I wanna be careful there because a lot of people know that ceramic capacitors lose capacitance with applied voltage. And so sometimes you might be thinking that that's a D rating and in a way it is. And so really what I wanted to point out here is that lifetime does improve by derating the applied voltage. However, for most applications, you're more interested in how much capacitance do I get back by derating the voltage. So we'll call it derating in quotes, so to speak. Okay, so what about other characteristics like temperature and time? How do those affect the capacitance of my device? Right, so as we're kind of talking here, voltage has an effect on the capacitance. And so what we like to talk about is capacitance stability. What happens to the capacitance value of a capacitor with these attributes you just mentioned? So if we look at, for example, voltage, looking at how voltage affects the capacitors, the capacitance value doesn't really change in most technologies except for ceramic. Now it may have an effect on the lifetime, but the capacitance value itself is gonna stay stable regardless of the voltage you apply to it. We look at how does temperature affect it. In this case, I'm only thinking in terms of a positive temperature or a higher temperature. So as we get closer to say 85 degrees C, what's gonna to happen to the capacitance? And again, with KO cap, aluminum electrolytics, and super caps, we're not gonna see the capacitance shift very much. However, with ceramics, like in X7R, X5R, at 85 or 125, you could lose up to 15% of the capacitance. And then the last one to consider is time. What's gonna to happen to the capacitance over the time that this capacitor is in operation? And so, for example, anything with a wet electrolyte, so like an aluminum electrolytic or a supercapacitor, they're gonna be rated at how much capacitance did they lose over time. And so they're going to lose something during their operation. Now, in both of those cases, it's well documented what those curves will look like, so you can design for that, but it is something you need to consider. Now, when it comes to, say, KO cap, there's virtually no loss of capacitance over time. It's probably the most stable of most capacitor types, certainly in this group. One point I do wanna make is, I am calling out ceramic as stable over time, even though there is a known aging effect with ceramics. However, after 10 years, an X7R is only going to lose on the order of three to 5% of capacitance. And I think it's kind of fair to say, if we're only talking a few percent, I'm gonna call that stable. Okay, James, so you're talking about time and aging. Let's say I'm designing a system with a five-year warranty. What about reliability? What's gonna to happen to my device over five years? Wow, you know, the question about five years, that never comes up with SSD customers. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So. Reliability is a whole nother subject. And let me just start off by saying one thing I would strongly recommend is if you're concerned about reliability, like in the case of a specific time period, once you've identified the capacitor technology you're interested in, I would really encourage you to talk to a field application engineer to make sure we understand the need. But here's some high level things to consider. And maybe these are some questions you can ask the FAE to help facilitate that conversation. In terms of reliability, what I wanna think about is wear out mechanisms. What causes the capacitors to literally wear out over time or during their operational life? So as I just mentioned a minute ago, wet capacitors are going to degrade over time. Their electrolyte dries up through various means that changes their characteristics. With solid capacitors like a KO cap or a ceramic, there can be changes and there will be degradation over time, but it's typically either on a scale that is well beyond what the usable application is going to be, or it's so little that we basically ignore it. And so we need to think about what's going to be the operational lifetime of the capacitor. And then one of the easy rules of thumb to think about is operating temperature. If a capacitor is rated for a certain temperature, in almost every case, when you back away from that temperature by some amount, you're going to increase its operational lifetime. And so, for example, if you're designing for an 85 degrees C application, you really need to think about whether you should be operating your device at 85 degrees C. Now, if it's a case of a duty cycle where it's generally at 70 degrees C, then that's probably something that isn't gonna be a big deal. But if you design your device for 85 degrees C and you expect it to last for five years at that temperature, then you really need to consider what the operational life will be. And then lastly, since we're talking about reliability, I did wanna mention how these get mounted to an actual circuit board. One thing to consider on the super caps is that they tend to be these flat foil packages that you have to hand solder onto a board. And so even though I'm talking about operational life, when I think reliability, 
Anytime a manual process is involved, I'm always worried about variability in manufacturing. And so with at least the other technology types, they're all surface mount. And that's a characteristic to place into consideration. Okay, so going back to my admittedly kind of scary calculations from earlier, how much energy can I store in these different types of capacitors? Do they have significantly different energy densities? The answer to that question is it depends. As I mentioned during the calculator, it really depends on what is the maximum and minimum voltage we can operate at. But using some typical numbers that we know about, we've gone through and created a typical example of what the energy per device is in millijoules. And so one thing I wanna say is don't take these numbers as absolutes. There's lots of variability we can introduce to change these numbers, but we tried to compare similar devices in a similar application with similar voltages applied. And so what we can see here is that ceramics have the lowest energy per device, which isn't a surprise because they actually have the lowest capacitance of any of these examples. Whereas supercapacitors, which as you alluded to earlier, seem exciting because they have a lot of storage capability. So if we take it one step further and then take into account their size, we can see what their energy density is. And what we see here is that ceramics starts to look a little bit better, but boy, that super cap looks really exciting. I mean, it's an order of magnitude bigger than the KO cap. However, what I took into account here is that there are no changes over the lifetime of the capacitor. And so if we calculate at the beginning of the life, all of these numbers work. But remember, we talked about all these changes that are going to occur, so that's gonna change the math when we get to the end of life, as well as, like I mentioned, the manual process. So just from a pure scientific, if we look at the numbers, I think these are a valid comparison, but that's only one aspect that we have to consider. Okay, so obviously we're here because, well, at least I'm getting the sneaking suspicion that you want me to choose KO cap for my solution. Give me a, a summary of why exactly. Okay, so let's just kind of summarize everything we've talked about so far comparing the technology. We just talked about energy density, so I'll start there. Energy density is pretty good on all the caps except for ceramic. And again, this is a relative thing. I'm not saying anything bad about ceramics. If we look at the voltages that are available, what I really wanted to highlight here is with all technologies except super caps, we see the potential to go to higher rate of voltages we're kind of stuck with the technology that super caps are at. In terms of their heights, the one capacitor that really has a height issue is the aluminum electrolytic. They're really tall. If you're talking about a card device where you have 10 or 20 millimeters between it, it's probably a usable option. If you're talking about a 2.5 inch drive where you're folding boards on top of each other, you're looking at one of the other three. That one's a kind of an easy one to segment out. In terms of capacitance stability, my comment here is gonna be wet versus solid. The solids are gonna have better stability over time. And in terms of overall reliability, again, reliability in this case, meaning operational life, again, the solids are going to be in a better position. Okay, I think I'm ready to get started. Where should I go for more information and what exactly will I find when I get there? So, of course, we've got data sheets for all of the Kemet products that we mentioned, so we can go and see what some of their capabilities are. The KO Cat page has a catalog specific to SSDs, as well as links to other information related to designing in SSDs. All right, well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, James. Thank you, Amelia. I had a great time talking about this. Before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out even more information about capacitors for SSD systems from Kemet. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of eejournal.com or check out YouTube, keyword eejournal. E.